tip the scale. Just remember that. Then. There's a small bit of a needle there. But come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen, Big Green, and now they're really rolling. And I can tell you, tell you, that there won't be a cow milk cow declare for at least a week. Hello, everyone. You're very welcome to the Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show in, a, in partnership with Allianz. My name is Paul Rouse and I'm joined by the former Mayo footballer and manager James Horn, by the former Dublin footballer Kieran Whelan and by Morris Brosnan, the senior sports writer with the Irish Examiner. Kieran, I want to start with um, a very uh, a very simple question, very direct question. What makes the GAA in Dublin different? Oh, that's a lovely question to start with, Paul. Uh, what makes it different? Um uh i suppose this and it, it's for me it, it's kind of about your family values and being being brought up in the tradition in a ga family and a ga home um and i suppose the tradition of the dublin team going back to the 70s and, and probably the dirty dozen in 83 is kind of uh something that you know i always wanted to follow in footsteps and and, and that's probably what a lot of young kids strive to do um in a strange way, I don't believe the tradition of Dublin GA is as strong in Dublin as it is in other parts of the country. Uh, and, and I mean that in the context of, you know, people's interests. I think the GA might mean more, you know, particularly in northern counties and, and, in, and in rural uh, And that's probably based around population and stuff like that. And, you know, certainly within um, the GA family in Dublin, you know, I've certainly seen a lot of more first generation type people getting involved in GA that didn't have that tradition uh, and, and probably lack a bit of understanding around it as well, if you know what I mean, and the context of how a club operates and how it works. But um, I think how do you define tradition? It's a very, very hard one. You know, as I said, you know, Dublin football football was always in Dublin but then if you go back probably to the earlier part of the century Hurland was probably before the team of the 70s came along Hurland was probably stronger uh, so I think it, it, in everyone's mindset it's different but for me you know Dublin football and tradition is Crow Park it's still 16 uh, it's it's uh, playing in front of 70 80,000 people and and that wants to wear, wear wear that jersey but as I said I think it's different in every county if I'm being honest yeah it's 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 a question of recognition as well though if you're if you're when you were playing for dublin to what extent were you recognized as you went around the city um again a very interesting question because of the population and and i suppose from 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 a dublin perspective certainly in your early days you weren't but as things progressed and maybe if you <laughs> it depends what you've done on the pitch <laughs> uh if you had some trans yeah, good trans thing or a bad transgressions a bad thing a good thing or a bad thing but yeah certainly as a as your career developed and your profile got higher uh you were certainly recognized but but only within ga circles and dublin is such a big place and um I would I would certainly suggest you know be interested to hear the lads' views, but it's definitely easier to hide as a Dublin footballer within Dublin uh, than it is uh, nearly outside of Dublin. If you if 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 you understand the context, you know I, I certainly knew when you travelled outside Dublin, uh, you were much more recognisable, uh, and whether that was uh, praise or abuse, a bit of both. Uh, but you know you, you you're you're able to kind of hide within Dublin because of the vast size of it, and I think. That's 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 definitely where Dublin differs with with the rest of the country. James, were you able to hide anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I couldn't find enough hiding places. Ah, no. Um, um, I, look, look down. I, I think Kieran's, and you're right, Kieran. That's a that's a stinker yeah. of a question for him to start off with. <laughs> I mean, no mercy, no mercy. But um, I think it is. It's very different in 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 maybe. West of Ireland or, or, or other counties outside Dublin, obviously with so much going on in Dublin. But um, in 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 Mayo, I suppose it's it, it's a huge it's a huge thing. It's it's a huge part of nearly our way of life down here. It's um, one thing that I, I I suppose now I stand standing where I am now, looking back at my time with with, with Mayo and involved in Mayo and playing with Mayo is it's 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 about it it's about it's about sort of almost family and experiences is is, is what I what I see the have come up to me since I've I've sort of retired about this game and how 
They went up the night before. They met their brother that lives in Kildare. They met their cousins. They had lunch in some place before the game. They went to the game, and the game's the game. And then after the game, they went back to Kildare. They got out of there quickly, and they stayed there, and they had a meal together, and they came back. So it's about this connections and relationships and experiences and all that. that that's what, what I think, say, the, the power of Mayo GA is. And the amount of people, well, see, the amount of people from the West that travel to to Dublin or that are living in Dublin, they go to college in Dublin or go to college in other places. So GA games becomes this c- collection point for families. Uh, and the game is the, is the source of that, that connection. So I, I think it's a hugely powerful thing. And, and the team as a result of that the team are successful and the more games they have in Crow Park, the more, more of those events families and people have. And, so it becomes this powerful sort of juggernaut, certainly down where we are. And and um, it becomes a huge aspect of people's lives in a hugely, hugely positive way, I, w- I would say. So so it's super. But yeah, very few places to hide when when, when that train gets derailed, let's say. So, so, uh, there's, there's, there's good and there's, there's, there's some not so good. Uh, I think, Paul, one of the key differences, Paul, when you think about it, like even back when I played and probably even going back when James played it, you know, you, you get away with Dublin having a quiet pint somewhere in a pub. No one would see or know you were there. You know, I doubt you get away with it down in, the, down in Mayo having a quiet pub. Someone would, yeah. someone would rat you out. I'd say, you know, yeah. and you'd be a bother. Kieran, do you do you think tradition ever wins a match for a team? Uh, no, I don't. No, I don't. I I I, I think. I think it, again, it comes back to what you define tradition. Like, like uh, you know, when when I was awfully have a great tradition, don't they? You know, um, you know, Tyrone, did they have a tradition of winning all Ireland's when they came in the noughties and won three, you know, when they got to finals? Uh, so I don't think it really does. I think I think certainly um, tradition can help maybe in longevity uh, in terms of where the teams are. And, and, and if you're an inter-county player and you you obviously have that desire to keep going to get to the promised land and if you're if you feel your team has a chance so i think you know is is it where your team is placed in the rankings of 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 their chance of success rather than tradition i don't think particularly in a modern day game paul i don't think tradition has a huge impact uh on on how how teams go about games at the moment no i don't yeah i was trying i was trying to think about it in what way it might matter and the only thing i could come up with is is that I think it sets expectations. So the bar for the bar for success in Kerry, for example, the Kerry tradition is to win in All-Ireland or, mm. or bust. So I think it might help in setting expectations. A second way it might help is traditions of people playing. You're more likely to be drawn for a game where there's a strong tradition of the game. But in the so that I think you're right that it helps in the longer run and mm. in the longer span of things, but maybe not. Uh, precisely in the moment, Morris. What, what? How do you think? Does tradition matter? Um, it does definitely. It it does. I think it, it depends on your definition of tradition. Like the two boys have given very articulate answers there in terms of the broad, overarching term. But if you refer to tradition, which often happens, particularly in media, in the context of style, I think that's it's just a nonsense. Like there's there's no. It is absolutely nonsense in Galway. It's a nonsense in Kerry. There, it's an overacting stuff that we kind of hark back to the golden age of Galway football, but there's just there's no evidence for a lot of that stuff. So in that context, I think tradition doesn't fit. But I do think there is. I kind of imagine tradition part as it's like it's an overacting term for a lot of other stuff. James, you gave um after your first term, you gave a brilliant interview to Keith Duggan where you talked about the tangible benefits of tradition. I don't know if you remember that, but the, the genuine stuff that stems from it. And you were talking about it in the context of Kerry and how, um, I don't want to misquote you here now, but I think it was something along the lines of how everybody's kind of on message, how whether it be Daryl Shea or Tom Shea, whoever, there is a very definitive, um, I don't particularly like this word, but narrative that stems from, from there. And I do think in that context, tradition does count for something. I look at Kerry now, for example, and I think I do think... Tradition definitely it underpins the team. There's because of the you want to talk about the different aspects of tradition. You take a guy, Paul, for example, like Donald Sullivan Down, who came on uh, for Kerry last weekend. He burst onto the scene as a 23 year old, and I think at a lot of other counties, a guy like that 
you could credit tradition for his development, for why he is still there. Now, tradition in reality is just an overarching term for a load of different stuff. It's the divisional club system. It's the amount of club football he plays. It's the not wanting to go away. Like the fact that he is knocking on the door first. He was there. I was in 2017. Kerry played Clare in a Munster Championship game, a minor game, and uh, I remember. I, I, the reason this sticks out in my head is because they hockeyed them. Like it was a 25 point hammering. And Jim Ryan, the hurler from Catlow, he was the only Clare player to score from play. But that day, I think uh, O'Sullivan scored he's like two seven or something like that that day. And he was overshone because that was the same team that David Clifford was in. But he he was he was earmarked from there and didn't get his chance until what six years later. But because of you can credit to tradition and what the tradition means, it means that he is playing football every single week, whether it be with Kilgarvin, with East Kerry in the East Kerry Championship, in the Divisional Leagues, in the Divisional Championships, he c- continually wants to play for Kerry. So in that context, I do think tradition counts for something. But it is a, there's a lot of branches to that tree, if you know what I mean. Like you could use the... Are Kerry unique in that regard because they've won more All-Irelands than anybody else? Potentially, yeah. You know, you know. And so there's kind of a an expectation or a tradition that you can lean on. But does it does it does it really matter for a lot of other counties? Is it is it cyclical? Is it timing? You know, uh, or is it a priority? Is it enough for priority? Mm. Actually, Kieran uh, Morris Morris said something very interesting there about in respect of tradition and uh, what James was saying about Kerry being on message. Do you think there's a Dublin narrative in the media as well? <laughs> <laughs> a Dublin narrative in what context? Well, you know, the idea that, you know, say, you know, there's the 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 idea that you know you rally behind the flag. We rally behind the flag. Uh, no. Did you feel pressure? No. So did you feel pressure ever? Like you you knew those guys. The only the only tradition we have is we've home advantage in Crow Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so did, did you feel pressure? Yeah, did I'm, you feel pressure running into those lads? I mean that is a genuine question. Like, did you feel pressure, you know, in your club, say running into Brian Fenton and Brian Howard or around the city running into lads that you know you know Jim Gavin, etc.? Did you feel pressure um when uh, during those years? During the years when Dublin were winning, to to say, did you feel did you find it hard to criticise Dublin during those years? Well, I suppose it it was difficult to criticise them because they weren't doing a whole lot wrong. <laughs> to, to, to be, you know, what I mean, <laughs> uh, and you know, to win six in a row. So, it, it, like in some ways, you know, Paul, like, you got lucky in that regard that. You know, since since I retired, and obviously timing was was wasn't one of my best uh, uh, f- facets. Uh, <laughs> since I retired, they obviously they, they obviously went on and won, you know, an eleven and then thirteen, uh, and then came back and won six in a row. So y- you couldn't really criticise them. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we we witnessed probably one of the best teams ever, and and. Uh, you know, I know James was incredibly unlucky and Mayo in various years. And, you know, they were obviously a brilliant team as well. But you didn't really feel, you know, uh, there was there was anything sticking out there that, you know, yeah. I did, no, I, I didn't, no, I didn't feel pressure really. No, I wouldn't have felt pressure at all. Because it, 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 was, it was it was such a it, it was such a glorious period for Dublin. Would I have loved to have been involved? Absolutely, of course yeah. you would. Uh, you know, the, and 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 is there? You're looking from the outside in, thinking, God, if I was ten years younger, wouldn't it have been brilliant? But but you know, you can't listen. There's more important things in life. You have to you have to come and deal and accept that and accept where you are. And um, I think certainly, you know, when I go back to particularly probably eleven and thirteen, when you're when you're when you're retired and you're only out maybe a couple of years, and you you feel like there was possibly maybe you had there was a small opportunity or a small window there that you could have been involved yeah absolutely they were they were tougher years and not you know it was tougher years from the outside looking in but like everything you 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 adapt to it and and it becomes what so no no, i never absolutely never felt pressure was it was great meeting up with the did you find it did you find it hard to see dublin win you know in 11 yeah, absolutely, Paul. Yeah, um, it, it only natural. It was always going to be tough when you're yeah. inside that dressing room for 14 years uh, and you make the decision to exit. Now I knew I knew my time was up, and if I had been there in 11, I, I might have played a very very limited role. Uh, but it's still, you know, I was delighted for the lads that I was in the dressing room with uh, at the time. It's cert- but it's certainly bittersweet, and it was, it's. Uh, 
when you've gone back every year to try and get to that promised land and that's your ultimate goal and you don't get there um it, it and then then you see your teammates going up those steps absolutely it was a tough time um if i'm being honest um but you you adapt to it and you accept it and you know a lot of people i get that comment a lot of times saying oh you missed out on the all ireland i i do it all again i do it all again with the same results if i'm being honest with you because you can't beat that time uh, but was it difficult standing back uh, and particularly working for the Sunday game and sitting beside Pat Spillane and, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> up in the Hogan stand. And uh, you're thinking, well, I actually, well, at one stage he thought Kerry were out the gap. There were four points up that day and then Dublin turned around. And like, it's it's a, it's an iconic day in Dublin history. And would I have loved to be involved? Absolutely. But, you know, you, they're, they're the breaks in life and things could be a lot worse, I suppose, couldn't they? I can think of worse places to be yeah. sitting than beside Pat Spillane as that game ended. <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think that might, might, there might have been a certain enjoyment. Uh, yeah, in, no uh, was, yeah. In 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 all of that, um, James, did you did you try and tap into any sense of history of Mayo football when you took over, or did you just was it relentlessly looking forward and forgetting about the past? I I know. I, 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 over time, look at you, you when a when a team is starting off. There's a there's a life cycle to a team, you know. So 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 when you get a team together, uh, you, you know it might be technical or tactical aspects you're looking at, or just togetherness or whatever it is. But 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 over time, you 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 know, as you mature as a group, you you're more aware of of who you're representing and what you're representing, and and the way of life maybe you're representing. So so of course you'd be you'd be you'd be conscious of of the best training camps we ever had uh, was we went to Belmullet. I mean, to the far ends of Belmullet. And um, Black Sod. Oh, yeah. You, you know, for, for four or five days. And we stayed in the local hotel. We played on the local pitch. We Some of the guys that are, 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 are uh, fishermen there brought us out in their boats. They went through their way of life. We went for a for a, a dawn walk along the coast with a with an old farmer that's been doing it for you know fifty years, and just you you get that sense of place and that sense of who you're representing. That you know when you're going up on a bus to Crow Park, that guy is walking that dawn walk or he's doing that job. You know, so you get you get a real connection with with with, with the place and the people there are, are 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 very proud of you and you're very proud to to, to represent them. You know, so you, you get a strong connection there and where you are, and of course. You know, Mayo's history, we, we would have done quite a bit of work with different people in different groups. We would have had a lot of talks down through the years and whatever, right right back through history from when Mayo people were leaving, you know, through the famine, through everything else, and to Heller, to Connacht, and all that. All that sort of sense, sense of sense of, of where we're from and where, where we're trying to get to. So so I, I think it's a, it's a hugely important um, part of it as a team builds. But, like, every team has... There's, there's different form and stages of a team. You know, if you try to do all that stuff all at the beginning of a young team, it would might make any sense. But as you go through through time mature, it, it, it it's it's certainly something. So we would have looked back at, at a lot of people, and we would have got a lot of male people that have been very successful in business or have done well or have traveled or have done whatever to you know come in and tell us, you know, their story or what what you know from where they came from and how where they got to where they where they are now. So so yeah, we would have done a quite a quite a bit of work on on that side of things. And do you, do you think you're different than a Galway person? <laughs> in 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 our outlook as, as a county. Yeah, well, like I mean, you know, in what way is a Mayo person different than a Galway person? <laughs> Is, is this being recorded? Is it? Is this one? <laughs> you're, Paul, you're you're on it today, man. You're you're you're, you're um, um. Well, like you're you're close to the border, right? Yeah. And it's it can be tense enough, and there's obviously a lot of good fellowship as well. But like, do you think you're different than like I know I grew up very close to the West Mead border, and um, we thought we were different than them but but if you asked us to explain exactly how yeah I, i'm i'm thinking as you're as you're talking yeah but i mean we felt sorry for them but i can't even remember why yeah. we felt sorry for them um of male people would go to college in galway i mean a huge amount so there's there's connections at every level as, as regards as as counties as regards sport and, and particularly ga 
the amount of people that go to, go, go to UCG, the amount of people that are, w- w- would be up there, that live there, that are just working there, that, that are up and down. So there'd be a, there'd be an awful lot of, of, of connections between between the two the two counties. Um, how would I describe it as a different? I suppose Go- Galway had this reputation of this. I think someone referenced it earlier on of this free flowing, um, skillful type of football. That was that was. That was that was always there traditionally, and that came through. And 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 you know you'd you'd hear the commentary then on on GEA, Pat's plan, one of these things. Go away, play a game, where they would kick a point, and it'd be a brilliant score and the free flowing football. But yet the rest, you know, you know, so the rest of the game could have been horrible. Yeah, sort of Mayo or, or go away football. Mayo, I suppose. We're, we're, we're how would I, how would it describe us as as being different? I suppose there's a real, um, not honesty. I don't. I don't mean I'll go over dishonest, but there's real honesty to how how, how Mayo, how, how how Mayo play and went about went, went about their football, and there was great battles down through the years. And then, of course, you know, I'm just thinking of it as as, as I'm talking. We we had Tom Tier who played for Galway, and then he played centre half back for Mayo, and we had all this kind of stuff going on. So so it was great rivalry down through the years. And then then when I got in, involved in management, we we, we had great tussles. Um, with Galway, and we, we we got a jump on them for a few years, um, and 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 now they're coming back strong. So so look, there's, it's a it's a it's a brilliant rivalry. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question about what's 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 different, but I suppose there's a lot of a lot of commonality. I would say, um, and 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 a great rivalry. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of a tricky thing to draw those lines, but the lines are on the map, and the whole structure of the GEA is based around these lines on a map which are were well, written by the British administration across three, four hundred years, Wicklow being the last Wicklow being the being being the last one to be to be set out as as a as a county, but they're almost artificial, but they're so real in our lives and that they the first thing that people start talking about is where you're from, as if it makes you somehow different than the people beside you. And it kind of it draws it in, but when you break it down, finding difference like Kieran, the differences between you and Kerry, Dublin and Kerry, like set them out there. What makes you different than a Kerry person? <laughs> uh, what makes me different? Um, well, I suppose you know, obviously, being in Dublin is thirty-one v one, which we're all used to anyway. So that, <laughs> that comes with, that, that 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 comes with tradition, Paul. Um, <laughs> But uh, what's the difference between, I suppose, the difference between maybe Dublin and and, and, and Kerry, and it goes back to your original question, probably around tradition, is that maybe maybe in Dublin there's, there's more um, opportunity in, in terms of other sports and there's more, uh, particularly with kids growing up and, 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 you know, obviously Leinster rugby is very vibrant and the rugby schools are very vibrant in Dublin and, uh, soccer probably more prominent. I, 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 it goes back to that thing that Gaelic football in Kerry probably is deeper in the blood, maybe, than it is in 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 parts of Dublin. Um, and and that to me is probably the biggest difference. As much like the Dublin Kerry rivalry was built on the seventies and was built on the Hefo era, and Dublin exploded in seventy four, and this big rivalry kicked on and that's kind of the Dublin Kerry tradition since then uh, but I, I, I just think in, in it goes back to the point I made at the start that you know Gaelic football is probably a, a stronger religion in, 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 in Kerry than maybe it is in parts of Dublin and mm-hmm. I, I think that's probably what probably distinguishes as much as you know when it gets to 15 v 15 on the field of play that all goes out the window and there's a there's a big GA family within Dublin that are very passionate about it. But I just think it's, uh, it's, 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 that's, that to me, it's, that's the only difference that I can, I can certainly see. Yeah. I, 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 to, to move slight, well, to move somewhat on from that, um, Morris, one of the outstanding performers on the league, in the league so far in the first two games is a Galway man or a man who was born in Galway, we should say, uh, who's playing in goal for us common. Um, uh, would you talk a little bit about him? Yeah, Connor Carl. Um, so Connor is the he's like it's funny. You look back on Galway Ross Common game last weekend. I I've never seen this. Maybe James could speak more about it or Karen. But uh, the if you look back on the kickouts for Ross Common, 
Roscommon were a hundred percent, a hundred percent on going long with kickouts. Every single they did not go short once in Pierce Stadium. And I think it's it's interesting in the context of hold on, they won one hundred percent of their long kickouts. No, they didn't go short ever. They do and not they go didn't short. go short at any point. They, they, so they went long on everyone. Sorry. They they go long, they went long on every single kickout. They never once went to never once tapped that ball short. And I think it's it's interesting in the context of why Connor is in Roscommon. So let's start there. Um Connor Card was a brilliant Absolutely brilliant underage goalkeeper from Ormore Mary is still a brilliant there intermediate club here in Galway. He's still a fantastic goalkeeper, but he was a sub on the under twenty Galway team under Park Joyce in twenty nineteen. They won a kind of they bet me on a kind of final. They won a kind of title that year, and a year later he transferred to Roscommon. Uh, his uncle is actually the chairman of Roscommon right now, so there's that's the the link. It's a family link, and since then it's. Kind of, there's been talk every single year. I spoke to Sean Ogdepoer at the end of the club campaign last year, and he is adamant that the best goalkeeper in Galway right now happens to be playing for Roscommon. That Connor Car- and the second best goalkeeper is Connor Flaherty, who isn't involved in the squad. If anybody watched the Sixers Cup last week, they would have seen him playing goals for UL. Who he, I thought his kickouts again were exceptional. But um, I think it's interesting in the con- so Connor in itself is uh, he's the perfect hybrid between this conversation that a lot of people are having now, Paul, about a fly goalkeeper and your traditional goalkeeper. Like he had 25 possessions against Tyrone in the first week. He would 17 against Galway last week. He's beaten two men. He had an assist for Ben O'Carroll's point in the second half. But he's not coming up and clogging up space and doing all the stuff that tends to get traditionalists back up. He's just kind of the, if you want to call it, he's like the point guard. He's the last man. When they have, you know, floating forward or 50 men, it's, you get these over and back phases. He's the last man getting on the ball. He's very, very comfortable with that. What Ross Common are doing with their kickouts in itself is, is remarkable. Like I've, I've never seen a team as committed to going long when all the statistics in the world point to the fact that as much as it drives people crazy that your short kickouts are more successful, but they're just absolutely adamant that this is the way they want to play the game. They don't actually score a huge amount from going long, but they don't concede it a huge amount either. So I think they scored one five from their kickout against Tyrone. They scored two points against Galway, only conceded one on their long kickout. But in, in the context of when you look at, just on the flip side of that, to put this in context, the fact they went long with so many of those kickouts, Galway went long with three kickouts in the entire game. So in that game, the, the other twelve kickouts, every single one of them they're going short. Whereas Common on the flip side have just for whatever reason, it's hard to necessarily break out why, but they're committed to going long. And in the context of maybe some of Galway's short fallings, it is interesting that uh, a guy as good as he is is playing as well for Ross Common. So I don't, I don't think we'll see him back in Galway anytime soon, as much as some people might like to see that. But um, he certainly is. He's carving out a fine niche there where it's coming. It'll be really interesting to see how they go this weekend against Amara, particularly given the, the context of what they're doing in goals as well. James, short or long? <laughs> <laughs> would you, like, would you go, do you, do you, do you want your team to go short or do you it, want to? It all depends. It, mm. it, it, it all depends, Paul, um, uh, on, on mul- multiple things. Kickouts are fascinating in, 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 in the uh, Um that you know you have what 50 60 kickouts a game it's the sort of one time you can you can reset you can set up you can get your structure right you can get people in position early you can you can do lo- loads of stuff it can break momentum so it's, abs- it's absolutely key but if you're if you're if you're thinking kickouts like and, you're, and again it all depends who you're playing and what you're doing but a lot of people go 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 short quite a bit um, and that's a possession based thing but if you think of that if you go short to your cornerback that ball has to pass through every single line of the opposition right so that that's tough going over the course of a game you know and that's the hardest place to score from you know if you think of it that way you've got to go through their half, full forward line you got. 45 yard driven sort of to each side you know where maybe you have a wing forward coming down to get it and you, you can turn it with the one pass you're within a score and you're within score and range that that can be a better option because with the kick out you're missing some of the opposition you're kicking it over them so yeah in theory you haven't as many people to go through but the, the long kick out i think is underused um i think it is and I, i'm sure morris will have the stats off the top of his head but if you kick long you're not going to win as many, right? You're 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 simply not on the, on the law of averages. I would say, you, you know, as as obviously a short, shorter, three quarter. But if you go long and depending, if you set up, you have a good break structure. 
you've good you have a good formation around the break zone you know where it's going to go so you can overload that side and all that kind of stuff and you can time a runner coming through that ball is good like if you're right you're playing Donegal and Sean Patton and there's a wind and there's a wind or whatever can kick that ball so far that it's landing on the opposition 45 one break and it's it's it's, it's over the bar one break and you could be through on goal so there's 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 both make sense the three the three types of kick out for me make sense depending on where things are where you're getting success what you need but if you keep playing short all the time opposition are going to set up that way they'll be happy enough for you to take short like it's funny sometimes we 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 say when we're pressing an opposition kick out let's say you know like if you're again we're playing we played Monaghan last year and, and Rory Beck and they kick out with the breeze how far is he going to kick that ball right so that's 80 yards he's going to kick that ball so instead of pressing in forcing him to kick it long you drop your press a little bit on one side so that Monaghan have that free corner back or that free half back so you want Rory Began to kick it to giving them a short kick and then you can set up you can set up you can set up to get get him on the second ball or to get their press on the second ball if you understand what I mean. so this, the kickouts to me are a fascinating scenario but to me the optimum kickout is the three quarter driven where you get a very high return you're kick you're you're skipping over some of the opposition long one good on certain occasions depending on what you're looking for depending on where the game if you want possession, if you've given away a couple of scores and you need possession, you need your players on the ball again to build a score, go go short. Kieran, you were you were in that Dublin midfield when Stephen Cluxton said about revolutionising kickouts. Did what was it like to be to be there as it happened? It was great, Paul, because he made me redundant and I ended up retiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, stopped, that, he's, he stopped, that's, he stopped kicking it out to the middle yeah. but that's that's actually not a joke I swear that's exactly what happened um, you know it, 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 the kick out probably started to evolve from around that time and Pat Gilroy came in with Dublin with Mickey Whelan and they had done you know obviously a bit of research to, around the possession and having possession of the ball and getting a shot off and the amount of chances you create if you're in possession and then if you're kicking out the ball long 100% of the time you're going to lose a percentage of that much you're conceding and so they had done a lot of homework at that time on that and we we basically went this was you know Cluxton had started it probably a couple of years earlier where he used to look for Shane Ryan Shane Ryan on the runner yeah yeah, yeah the and, 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 and into the pocket like we used to free yeah. up the wing the wing back spaces and he'd just pop it into that space and it started there and if he wasn't available then he'd go long but then he went to just really short pop it out and I suppose the press didn't really exist you know the, the the teams there was no emphasis on the on the press because the short kick out wasn't wasn't a thing so uh i think i think like james is 100 percent right it's uh, it's fascinating how it's evolved over a period of 10 12 years because when dublin started to do it um you know we moved into the probably the donegal era where they were dropping men back and then we saw teams starting to concede the kick out ultimately we went through a couple of years where a lot of teams would actually 100 percent concede like Tyrone done it in numerous games and that was bringing teams so far that they were concentrating on their defensive structure their setup and uh, they were getting bodies back and they were hoping to hit on the counter counter attack but I then I think we, we we pushed on then to the next level where I think Kerry reckoned that Dublin getting all this possession and Cluxham was so good and all the stats show that Dublin got their shots off and got their scores Kerry put a lot of emphasis in trying to press that kick out and 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 force Dublin into mistakes and remember they were the first ones to really yeah. push push up 10 and push four into the full into yeah the full all, 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 all the way in and and so I think again the dynamic of the kick out changed again there where teams started to look maybe for that longer one over the top hit one over the press depending on the circumstances uh, and I think we've seen a kind of evolve back into that you know where James is right that there's various times when teams will go for a short one, whether that's to break momentum, whether that's after a score, whether that's an option. But I think teams, you know, have evolved now in terms of their conditioning that they can they can they can press, they can defend. And, you know, a lot of the time you're seeing 
you know, full forward lines now drop into that 70 yard line or drop into half. If they can immediately concede the kick out, they'll drop off and they make it difficult for teams now to work through. So I think the game has changed, you know, radically over, you know, around the kick out over the last 12 years. And it's probably coming back to what Morris was saying that a lot more teams are beginning to maybe go for that longer kick out, go for that overload, have the, have the positioning right, because it get, gives you an opportunity to get at the opposition defense a lot quicker. You're not giving them a chance to reset. You're not giving them a chance to get back into their structure. And and, and that's why I think we're seeing a mix of it now. Uh, and, and long kickouts is coming back into it. So like it's, it's, it's nearly gone full circle in the last 12, 13 years, really, it would, would be my view. But I think it's a healthy thing. I think it's a healthy thing come back in. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in favor of these new rules. You have to kick it out over the 45 meter line because that will just, you know, you're, Going to, teams will just naturally drop off. I think we have to leave it as it is, but I think teams are now much better conditioned that they will press when the time is right. They'll drop off immediately if they lose it, you know. Or 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 now when we see teams chasing the game, Armagh and even Mayo or Exxon done it against Armagh. Both teams were, but when Armagh were chasing the game in the last few minutes, they went for a full court press where you're seeing the goalkeeper really coming up, and we're, you know, so we're seeing we're seeing huge changes i think of it and i think i think it's exciting i think it's positive because there's a bit of variety to the to the game because we did have a period where you know particularly those couple of years when teams were just giving up the kick out and going back and setting up in their defensive structure like that was that was awful stuff to watch do you know what i mean paul that's the what, what kieran said there that is the that is a crucial point in any conversation about kick out like in all the meaningless nonsensical stats that we're talking about in the GA, none were worse than retention rates. People talking about as if you know you could have a team with 90, 95 percent retention rates and what did they score from their kick out? Nothing. What did they score from turnover? What did they concede from turnovers? Two four, two five, because they're tapping the ball to a corner back, getting turned over every single time. And so but people are praising them for retaining possession from their kick out. But it's that's not the point. A kick out is what are you doing with it? Like what are you getting a shot off? Are, are you actually using your chance to develop an attack? And if you're not, you get turned over in the middle of the field. It was very easy to set up with. And I, I do think, like back to what James said at the start, the worst kickout you can have is, is a repetitive one. It's, if you stick to the same thing over and over again, it just makes it so easy to set up. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Galway need to develop a, a better long kickout option, especially if Damien Coleman's not there. Maybe it's a coincidence, but it is, it's interesting to me that Ethan Rafferty, the two worst days he's had from a kickout perspective in the last 12 months was... Twice against Donegal last year, once against Mayo. Just so happened Stephen Rocher was involved in all three of those games. I know for a fact the Cardiff Finn lads would speak very positively about how he revolutionised their ability to press when you're going to press and how you adapt to that. And I do think, like, just go back to what Kieran said there as well. That you can't, like, being wedded to one system, tapping, but you go back to the 2019 All Ireland final, the first four kickouts, Cluxton goes short, um, Mick Fitzsimons gets a belt off, Adrian Spillane coming out, gets turned over, Johnny Cooper gets turned over, Kerry keep pressing, he looks under the cosh, and what does he do? He lands the ball into Brian Howard's bed basket in, in, in the middle of the field, Jack McCaffrey's coming off the shoulder and ends in a goal. Like, it's ability to adapt, stick, being wedded to one or the other. Like That's why I'm surprised actually what Ross Common are doing by going long all the time, but particularly teams going short all the time as well. It's The best kick-out option is, is a varied one. It's having a bit of variety in and all, and amidst all of that, I think some teams kind of lost sight of that, particularly when they were obsessed with retaining the ball and it looked great when you could come back in and say, look how, look how positive our retention rates are here. But it's, it's what are you actually doing with it? How many, how many shots are you getting off? How many scores are you scoring and conceding with your kick out? That, that should be crucial in I'd, my opinion. I'd be interested, like, James, maybe in, in your view, because uh, I go back to 2000, the Dublin Tyrone final. Um, now, Stan corrected on this, Morris. You might you might have it, but I think Cluxton was possibly a hundred percent on his kickouts in the second half. I think Dublin won a hundred percent of their kickouts, and I think a lot of them went short. And Dublin obviously uh, carved Tyrone open. They created and, and went on to win the All Ireland. But would you, James, have seen that? Did you see that as an issue with Dublin when you were coming back here? That you had to do something different when you played Dublin. I, I, yeah, look at and again, teams playing Dublin during during Cluxton when he was at his peak. Um, it, you do an awful lot of work on it to try and predict it, but 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 Stevens Stephen had such a short back run very easily that it was very very difficult to 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 forecast where he was going to kick the ball. So it was a very difficult press against Cluxton for like he could get the ball out very quickly. We did, you know, five, six seconds he had the ball on the team within two to three seconds, it'd be with the player. So 
It was a very, very quick and an open play. So say say we got a score against against Dublin uh, from play. It's very difficult to set up a press from open play because think about it: your team are all over the place. Mm. The best the best time to set up a press is when say Killian O'Connor or whoever is setting for a free. So before the free, you're already set up in an optimum position for the kick out for the opposite. So you, you can you have a structured press. You can you can go out there, but. Where Cluxon was so good and the trajectory of the ball and everything else was, was so clever. But Stephen might have got the majority of the credit. But you when you have James McCarthy, you know, Paul Manning coming back for, for kick outs, you have Jack McCarthy creating space for others. When you have these guys that had free movement, you know, as Cluxon was setting up to it, it was very very difficult in the in the open space of Crow Park to, 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 to pin down a, a really, really tough press on, 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 on Dublin, you know? So, um, yeah, a lot of, lot, of, lot of analysis over that down, down through the years. <laughs> Just on a, on a related question, if people, if people are going to be kicking the ball much longer, as does seem to be, as the game, Kieran says, the game has evolved and it's gone back in that way, what's the single most important thing that helps you win breaks? That's yeah. That's a that's that's a good question. But like, if you think I thought Mayo the last year were really impressive on their on their on their opposition press, right? So if you're if we take the opposition kick out, so you're 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 pressing on that. You can press really hard, and if you can force him to go when it's long, and if you take Ethan Rafferty, Ethan Rafferty has a defined kick out, so you know when he's gone back on his run, you have a pretty idea which side it's going. Okay. So before he even starts his run towards the ball, which gives you a right, so before he kicks it on his run, it's probably two seconds. Then when he kicks it long, it's probably a four to six seconds. So you have eight to nine seconds, really, to get to a break zone. So if you can read that and go early, go really early, before he even starts his run up to kick the ball, you can overload the break zone. Very So it's your interpretation, your reading of it, your positioning, like... Like you see a lot of players, like on the half forward line in particular, the half forward line is very critical. Though. They're faking to go in, but they're looking to come out. You know, there's that general movement. They're going that five yeah. or six minutes, trying to entice a keeper, or trying to influence a keeper. They want them to go long because they're going early to get to the break zone. So if you get, yeah. you know, your three to four people at the break zone, the opposition might only have one with the jumper. We're going to do, is the timing of your entry into the break zone. I always remember Paul Gavin, who, who 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 I think is one of the best winners of breaking ball that I, I that I've ever seen. Is it was, yeah, he was strong and tough, but it was his timing of his entry into the break zone. He was coming in dynamically as opposed to fellas standing there stationary waiting for a break. So it's all all those things mashed together give you it increases your odds significantly of winning that breaking ball. Is that it, Kieran? It's it's force of numbers and timing. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't disagree with that. I think I think again, you know, most keepers long kickouts will be analysed uh, by the opposition. Uh, most keepers have a sweet spot where they're most comfortable. You know, um, certainly from a midfield perspective, you'd be looking at where that landing zone is, whether there's a wind, whether there's not a wind. You get a sense, and the, uh, particularly if you have a keeper that has a very consistent length in his kick out um so it's it, it's a combination of because from a midfield perspective like the break zone is so the break zone will win or lose a game in terms of if the majority kickouts are going going longer because a midfielder a midfielder if he gets four clean catches four to five clean catches in a game he's had a he's had a a, a sterling game you know so most the still the large majority of of of, of the kick out is those breaks and those and those break zones so i think the opposition keepers are are studied heavily and you have a fair idea where their sweet spot is and as james said that he makes a very valid point in terms of ethan rafferty the position of the keeper within a couple of seconds you know whether it's going left or right um and there's not that many keepers that you know, can 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 change that very Disguise quickly. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you've a fair you've a fair idea when a keeper lines up whether he's going to the right or left and, and the bodies have to get. But it is that it is that timing. And I think the timing sometimes is a can be a sense thing. Sometimes it can be probably hard to coach. Um, you know, but it's 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 really getting that timing as to where the where the break is and, and, and that time to come in to, to win it. But yeah, absolutely I think it's a it's a huge part of the game, yeah. We're um we're going to look at this weekend's matches pretty quickly. I think Mayo Kerry is 
is very tasty. Um, it's uh, um, it's one of those games that you know you just really, really look forward to seeing. We'll be talking about that game next week. Um, Monaghan Donegal. It, it looks already like just a, such a massive game in in terms of relegation or promotion. Even though as we we say that in week three, is that, James, you, as early as week three, would you be looking at that game as 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 a relegation thing, or is that just too much to say it? Well, well, Mon and Donegal, you, you, you know, uh, Mon in particular, if if they lose that game, it, it's it's not you know automatic relegation, but it's it becomes very hard. Yeah, long road. Mm. Down trying to stay up, you know, as such. So, so, so it stifles maybe some of the things you'd want to try, or some of the maybe things that you want to develop in your team. So it beco- it becomes a a tough a tough environment. So, so yeah, week three can be can can be very tough. You know, um, um, team teams looking at that at, at it that way, but. It's where you really you're hoping, and it'd be very interesting with Mayo and Kerry in particular. Like you know, who who are Kerry going to you know are the are Sean O'Shea back? Or, yeah, the Kerry going to be back? Um, you know, are they going to play party? Are they going to bring back the big gun? Same same with Mayo. You know, Paddy Durkin is close. Um, you know, Tommy's close. So so like it's it's who who are they going to play? You're hoping for week three after the two week break and the Sigerson done. Some of the niggling injuries from preseason tidied up that you're going to you're going to put a f- relatively strong team out there, probably as strong as 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 you can. Not gone well in the first two rounds, you know. So so it becomes a big it becomes a very big round, um, and it can dictate the rest of the league, and it can dictate the sort of pace that you progress towards the the championship bat. So um, lots lots of lots of lots of big games. Yeah, Galway Tyrone is a big one, isn't it? Like Gal- Galway, Galway will be under pressure if they lose to Tyrone. I think that's a that's that's a fascinating game. I might might try and might try and uh, sneak up to that, to that one if if if, if, if possible. But um, yeah, Gal- Galway have had a bit of bad luck and a bit of good luck, I suppose, with Damien Comer not 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 as bad not as, as first bad as, first, yeah. first mm. thought. Um, huge and I'm delighted because you want you want to see Damien Comer playing. He's just a f- fantastic player. But Rob Finnerty. Um, injured, you know that we know about their backs with with with, with Silk and Malloy out. Um, is Ian Burke around? So there's a lot of players that we're not sure where they're what's going on. For 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 developing and growing, they're they're sick of things not going well the last last twelve months or so. You know, um, so so I think they're gonna they're gonna be down, and that's going to be a dog fight for Galway. Uh, that's going to be a tough 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 game. And there's something very attractive about the Roscommon Armagh game, Kieran. The, the Roscommon on the bit of a on the crest of a wave, and Armagh, you know, dug it out against Mayo and you know win the first day. That's a kind of a big game. Yeah, and you know, listen, Roscommon. I don't think there was anybody really that anticipated Roscommon would probably have four points. I think a lot of people are writing them off um, as being relegation candidates. So uh, they're back in the hide, like Ar- Armagh. Listen, any game that Armagh go to play now, you know you're going to get an exciting game. Um, they're they're a good team to watch. You know, um, they're I think they still have a bit of improvement to do. I mean, honest, I think defensively they're still um, they're still a little bit suspect when 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 you get at them quickly. Um, I think Mayo certainly in the third quarter really got on top of them in the in the middle third and really got momentum um and 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 i think they've a few issues still to solve around midfield so listen roscommon will be looking at that paul and thinking if we got two points in the bag you know could we could we maybe pull up the handbrake they'd be quite happy just to stay in division one you would think going into the connacht championship and what the year holds ahead so i think that's round three and round four i think are crucial in that regard because listen i know it's probably touched on it in, in, in recent weeks in terms of the latter part of the league, depending on where teams are positioning. So Roscommon be looking to see get to make themselves safe out of that game. Uh, but Armagh will certainly Armagh will certainly put it up to them because they're they're uh, they've a lot of quality and particularly in their forward line. Uh, you know, the likes the form of Andrew Mornan and Tur- Turbot and Reen O'Neill, uh, Stephen Campbell, they're all and playing good football at the moment. So uh, yeah it be it will be an interesting one. And down in down in Division Two, Morris, um, 
the the glamour tie is obviously in 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 the old th- money of things it'd be Cork Dublin, but I think the real meat games are Derry Mead and Clare Kildare. Yeah, Clare Kildare is that just feels like a massive game, doesn't it? I think James nailed it there. Like the, this, the last two weeks is about resolving niggling stuff over preseason. The best performance I saw by a player in a losing team last year, Paul, was actually against E. James. Was Kevin Feely for Kildare that I just thought he was. Phenomenal. Uh, by all accounts, he played 70 minutes last Thursday in a challenge game. So if he's back now and motoring well, that's such a massive lift for Kildare, um, particularly given how that court game went. I can see them going down to Kildare. That, that, if there's not a response there, you would, I think you would have to worry. So that, that feels like an absolutely massive game. Um, I do think it'd be interesting to see, do Cork try and kick on a bit? They went ultra defensive against Dublin last year in the quarterfinal. Do they set out their style again, or are they committed to evolving in that style? That'll be that'll be kind of interesting. But I, I definitely do think Paul, there's a couple of like I, looking ahead to this weekend. There's a couple of kind of the, you don't want to overstock either, but there are definitely kind of defining games. I thought it was interesting, for example, as you go down the divisions. Now Carew from Carlo openly said after the last round that they now can target promotion. That's it's a a, a goal within that camp. It's probably going under radar slightly that. They, you know, Dark Foley's captain them again. There's kind of a nice blend. Like I'm not saying it's Carlo rising again now, but there's a nice blend between a good young crop coming through, but a fair amount of experience in that squad as well. There's only I think them Leash and Leach are the only undefeated teams in that division. So one of them is obviously going to go this weekend. But the winners of that Leash and Carlo game, they have to be favourites for promotion then suddenly. So there it feels like this weekend is a bit more significant. I know I was downplaying the open turnarounds a good bit over the last two weeks. I think you can put a bit more stock in what we see this weekend. Yeah, Division Three. There's there's big games in in Division Three. I know for my own county, Offaly, it'll be a real. I think James used the used the phrase "gut check" the last couple of weeks in terms of mm. going to Clare. I think for Offaly, who got absolutely yeah. demolished by Westmead in the Touching Cup semi final uh, last year, it'll be a real check test to see to what extent there's been progress or otherwise. Well, particularly Paul, after what you said about them uh, looking over the the wall at them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sure, you know, you're going to get them extra motivation this weekend. <laughs> looking over the wall and down at them. That'll be that. Just, just, uh, just really soup it up. Um, yeah, and and in in that division as well, like Cavan, Cavan are obviously sitting pretty, but for Manor down again is a is a is a lovely a lovely local match. So this is this is the phrase where the league is is probably still exciting because everyone still it can go any way for everybody still at this stage and these are the moving weeks Kieran. yeah absolutely and i think listen the objective of division three and obviously the way the the sam mcguire has fallen you know the, i think the winners and the runners up won't make probably into the sam mcguire so it's really getting up to division two next year is probably their goal so the league is their priority as well as having a good crack off the talton cup um you know you can certainly see okay longford have lost the first two games cavan you know mickey graham probably didn't put much stock on the league the last couple of years uh and you can you could see right from the outset uh, in the McKenna Cup, Cavan were feeling a strong team, uh, and you can see this determination. I think with with them to get back up to Division Two, to get to to, to get back in and ensure they sit there that they they stay in Sam Maguire. And then you've, as you say, you've Down, who look like they're reviving. Um, you know they're they're going to Fermanagh, and then Westmead and Offaly. Both of them, Offaly started well, and 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 Westmead will have ambitions after winning the Talton Cup to get up. So, like when we get to the latter stages of the league the top of division three and the bottom of division two is going to prob- possibly going to be where the talking points are yeah not really a, a, a massive spread between them and it's, i suppose that the, the favorites beforehand uh for demotion from uh from rele- or relegation from division two were loud and limerick who were um who were uh, both promoted last year and they meet this weekend and that's that's a big game and I think Loud Loud are, Loud have probably kicked on a little bit and are a little bit better than we're giving credit but we'll be looking at how all of these games uh, turn out um, when we come back um, next week I'd like to thank Larry Ryan for running this podcast I'd like to thank Raf Rocca Jack Neville Tony Lean and everyone at Examiner Sport thanks to Alliance for all their support as well a huge thanks to James Horn, especially to Kieran Whelan for joining us today, and to Morris Brosnan also. Bemich Harnashkalua.
Just a small bit of a needle there. Come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen back to Ian and 